During this video, we're going to talk about Hess's law, and hopefully by the end of it, we should be able to apply Hess's law for a system of related chemical reactions. And we'll talk about what we mean by related chemical reactions. Uh, we're also going to discuss balanced formation reactions. So this is a specific type of reaction for any compound. And then be able to use enthalpies of formation, what we'll see here, for a reaction to calculate the overall enthalpy change for that reaction. Now before we get into talking about Hess's law and enthalpy of formation, I want to remind us about a couple things about enthalpy. So enthalpy is a state function, and why is that important? Well, that's, be that's important because the change of enthalpy for a reaction, any chemical reaction, is the same no matter what step or process or path the reaction undergoes. So again, we could say here the delta H is the same no matter the path. So whatever path it follows. Because of that, again, because enthalpy is a state function, we can use this idea we call Hess's law. The enthalpy change for a stepwise process is the sum of all the enthalpy changes for each of the steps for that reaction. And so we're going to see here, we're looking at individual steps and overall enthalpy change for that reaction. In order for us to do this, we're going to look at this kind of system of related reactions. So this is looking at Hess's law. Here we have reaction one, two, and three. In reaction one, two, and three are looking at nitrogen and oxygen reacting or nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide being produced. Now, as we look at these reactions, we notice that we have different enthalpy changes for those reactions. And we also have the ability to diagram these in an enthalpy diagram. So again, if we have, let's connect our enthalpy diagram to these reactions. Here we have nitrogen and oxygen. So those would be our reactants here. As they go to produce nitrogen monoxide, we can think of them going up that step in the reaction. So that could be, we're thinking about reaction one. Well then reaction two, we now have that nitrogen monoxide here and oxygen combining to go down and produce our nitrogen dioxide here. Now we can think of this happening in two steps or we can think of it happening in a single step or the overall change of going from N2 and O2 to NO2. And so now again, we here we are looking at this, these interrelated or interconnected reactants and products. Now we look about a, a system of equations and how they relate to each other. The things that we can identify that's helpful is that we can look at the fact that we have similar reactants and products. So we see these, these kind of linkers here. We have NO, we have N2, we have O2, uh, we have NO2. So we notice that we have these different reactants and products that are connected or related. So because of that, we have the ability to relate these equations or look at the application of Hess's law here. So now let's do this by looking at our first example. So we can calculate the reaction, the enthalpy change for this reaction. 2NO goes to N2 and O2. So what we want to do is we want to look at does that relate, is that something similar to one of our reactions that we have here for reaction one, two, and three? And what we notice is that effectively, it's the reverse reaction of reaction one. So here, this is where we flipped our reactants and products compared to reaction one. Now if we think we're starting up here now, and we're going down to N2 and O2, so now if I go down, the enthalpy change should be negative, and the magnitude is going to be the same, 180 kilojoules. So we see here the enthalpy change for this reaction is the opposite of our first enthalpy change of the reaction that we have, because we've done is we flipped it, and so we can see here our enthalpy change is negative 180 kilojoules. You've flipped what our reactants and products are. Now we go to reaction two. And we see here we got N2 and O2 combining to give us NO. And again, what we notice here is that we have the same N2, O2, NO for my reactants and products. But here we see is that all of our coefficients 
are multiplied by three, right? We have, instead of one mole of N2, we have three moles of N2. Instead of one mole of O2, we have three moles of O2. Instead of two moles of NO, I have six moles of NO. And so we see here is that, well, what's that gonna do to our enthalpy change? We have three times as many reactants, three times as many products. So we can think of it, if we were to draw it, maybe our enthalpy diagram, it would just go like way off the board because we have the enthalpy of, we have more and more products, more and more reactants, the change there is gonna be greater. And so we'll see here, this is gonna be three times the enthalpy change of our first reaction because we've made it three times larger for the reactants and products. And we have to scale that for the reaction that we're looking at here. And so this, this would be three times 180 kilojoules. And so we'd get 540 kilojoules. And again, positive, because we didn't switch what our reactants and products are. All we did was flip, uh, or change the coefficients. Now, the last part that we want to do is we want to answer what is the enthalpy change for our third reaction here? So if we do that, let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit. So we want to identify the enthalpy change of our third reaction. Now what we notice is that we have N2, O2, we want N2 and O2, and we want to produce NO2. So there should be way, some way that we can combine our reactions that we know that have similar reactants and products, right? Again, we have NO2, NO2, uh, we have N2 and N2, O2 and O2. And what we notice is that if I were to think of going through reaction one followed by reaction two, that would give us reaction three. So we see the steps of going from reaction one to reaction two to react, and then the overall of those two steps is the same as our reaction three. And so what we'd want to do is we'd say, well, do I have the ability to say, let's add those steps together and see what does it give us? All right, so we add those steps together. We're gonna get, looks like one mole of N2, one, two moles of O2, and then we see here that our NO is on opposite sides of our reaction, and so it's going to cancel out. The net effect is that we're not producing more of it, and the net effect is that we're not getting rid of it. So it wouldn't be overall being consumed or produced. And then we also have two moles of NO2 being produced. Well, how does that relate to the enthalpy changes? So that would be the enthalpy change for reaction one and the enthalpy change for reaction two because we didn't change them, we didn't change the coefficients like we did down here or change the order. All we did was take these two steps and add them together. And so our enthalpy change for our third reaction is gonna be 180 kilojoules plus our negative 112 kilojoules for our second step or a total of 68 kilojoules. So we can go ahead and put here 68 kilojoules that we'd have for step three. So we notice we have the ability to relate these reactions. And this is what Hess's law is. It's looking at re related reactions. Do we think about possibly having to flip them, what our reactants and products are, and it changes the sign? Or are we going to change our coefficients? Are we going to multiply them all by some value? Three, divide by two, etc. And we do that same thing to our enthalpy change. So now that we have this background in Hess's law, let's look at a specific application of Hess's law. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at what we call a formation reaction. So a formation reaction is where we, a reaction where one mole, and this is real important here, one mole of a compound of interest is produced from pure elements. So that would be N2O2, solid carbon, etc in their naturally occurring physical states, so like oxygen gas, solid carbon, hydrogen gas, maybe something like N2 gas, and the enthalpy change that corresponds to that reaction is called the enthalpy of formation. Just think of it as the energy cost to form one mole of whatever that substance is. Right, that's what we would call a, the enthalpy of formation. So let's apply this looking at the formation reactions of water as a liquid and water as a gas. So let's start with first water as a liquid. 
Whenever I'm writing out my formation reactions, I always write my products out first. So I'm making water as a liquid, and I notice that I have hydrogen and oxygen as my elements in that, mo in that molecule. So that means I'm gonna need hydrogen gas, and I'm gonna need oxygen gas as my reactants. Those are hydrogen and oxygen are the naturally occurring states, H2 and H O2 for hydrogen and oxygen. And then what I want to do is I need to balance it. Now, real important here is that we have one mole. So this always must stay one mole. If I change that, it's no longer the formation reaction that corresponds to the enthalpy of formation of that substance. And so that would mean, what we'll see is a lot of times we'll have fractions. So we'll have H2, one half O2 gives us one mole of water as a liquid. We can do that same thing for water as a gas. So we notice they're just different physical states. We're gonna have the same elements that make that up. So hydrogen and oxygen, one half mole of oxygen to give us water as a gas. Now why is this important? This is important because this leads us to kind of a, uh, a building block enthalpy values for these substances. So number five tells us the enthalpy of formation for Water as a gas is negative 241.8, and the enthalpy of formation of water as a liquid, negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. So now let's, let's bring that back to this discussion of our enthalpy reactions. We can say the enthalpy change for this specific reaction, and this is a formation reaction of water as a liquid, is the enthalpy of formation of water in the liquid physical state. Likewise, I can say the enthalpy change for this reaction is the enthalpy of formation of my product here, water, in the gaseous physical state. And we know that from the information that we know, this is negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole, and this is negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. So those are known values that we would have. So if we have these building blocks effectively, now we have the ability to quantify the enthalpy change for those reactions that maybe include these reactants and products. So let's go ahead and move forward and think how we're gonna apply this. So now we have the enthalpy change for this reaction, two moles of hydrogen, one mole of oxygen, two moles of water being produced from that as a gas. So what we notice is that this is basically two times the enthalpy of formation of water in the gaseous physical state. And the reason why we could say that, we know that this is a um, substance, a reaction where we're taking just hydrogen and oxygen and making water as a gas. And we notice we can connect that, thinking of Hess's law, that it's basically two times as many hydrogen molecules, oxygen molecules, and water molecules being a part of our reaction here. So the enthalpy change for this reaction would be two times the enthalpy of formation of water as a gas, negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. I'm gonna go ahead and just make sure we're paying attention to units here. Two moles of water as a gas, negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole of water as a gas, and that would give us negative 483.6 kilojoules for that reaction. So again, we're looking at this kind of Hess's law application where we're looking at the magnitude or the, the uh, number of co the coefficients that we'd see if we have twice as many, our um, reaction is gonna produce, in this case, releases twice as much heat. Now let's look at where we don't just have maybe oxygen and hydrogen as reactants. So let's look at 5B here. We wanna calculate the enthalpy change for this reaction. So then we again here, we notice that we have water as a gas and water as a liquid. We could do the same thing that we just did looking at Hess's law. We can look at, we have some reactions that include these, but let's look at this generalization that we see here for enthalpies of formation. What we'll notice, the reason why these are so helpful is that we can use the enthalpy of formation for different substances to calculate the enthalpy change for a reaction based upon how much energy was released or absorbed to form our products minus 
how much energy is released or, or uh, absorbed to basically undo our reactants, unform our, we get our reactants we can think of and form or produce our products, right? Because if we know it costs, or we're gonna release 285.8 kilojoules to make one mole of water as a liquid, we're gonna have the opposite happen here. So how can we use this here as part of our reaction? So we could say the enthalpy change of this reaction is gonna be equal to the sum of all of our products. In this case, we only have one mole of water as a gas. And that would be multiplied by the enthalpy of formation of water as a gas. And then from that, we're gonna subtract one mole of water in the liquid phase, because that is our reactant here. We notice it's just a difference in physical state times the enthalpy of formation of water as a liquid. So let's go ahead and put some numbers to this. So we have one mole of water in the gaseous physical state and the enthalpy of formation of water in the gaseous physical state, negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. From that, we're gonna subtract, again, our one mole of water as our reactants, in this case, in the liquid physical state, times the enthalpy of formation of water is a liquid, negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. And we're gonna get positive 44 kilojoules. And we see here, this makes sense. It's gonna take energy to go from a liquid to a gas. We gotta put energy in to make that happen. How much that is, uh, we can calculate based upon the enthalpy of formation. So we notice that we don't actually, to calculate the enthalpy change for this reaction now, we do not need to actually complete the reaction experimentally. We have the ability based upon basically the costs of our reactants and products to figure out the overall cost of energy, how much energy is released or how much of energy is absorbed when our reaction is occurring. So we see here, basically our enthalpy of formation is an application of Hess's law that it doesn't matter the process that it takes to go from water as a liquid to water as a gas, it just matters overall how that reaction occurs. So now that we have this as a foundation, let's go ahead and take a time to pause and practice this. So here we have four enthalpy changes for, excuse me, three enthalpy changes for these three different reactions. And I want you to go ahead and answer questions six, seven, and eight on your worksheet as you're going to kind of apply this idea. Once you've had a chance to work through it, come back and check to see how I went through it. All right, so let's go ahead and answer these questions together. So number one, as we kind of think through this, question six asks us, which of these are formation reactions? So reminding us a formation reaction, making one mole of a compound from its elements in its naturally occurring physical state. So we notice here, reaction four, carbon dioxide, making one mole of it from oxygen and carbon, it's naturally occurring states. So we could say, yes, that is a re formation reaction. Number reaction five, we have hydrogen and oxygen. So those are pure elements. But here we notice it's making two moles of water as a liquid. So we wouldn't necessarily say that is a formation reaction. It's not gonna correspond to the enthalpy of formation for that substance. Number two, reaction six, two moles of carbon as a solid two moles of hydrogen as a gas to give us C2H4, one mole of that, yes, that would be a formation reaction. So here we could say, this would be equal to the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide, and this would be equal to the enthalpy of formation of C2H4 ethylene. So now we have some information here that we can utilize to answer question seven. Now question seven asks us to calculate the enthalpy change for this overall reaction. And what we'll notice is there's actually two ways to do this. Two ways to undergo this calculation. I'm gonna show us both of them and see they both lead us into the same result and that is because enthalpy is a state function. So no matter how we think about it occurring, 
we're going to still see it's going to give us our overall enthalpy change for our reaction, no matter which way we choose to do it. So the first way that we can look at is looking at the enthalpy of the change of our reaction using Hess's law. So now how would we use Hess's law? Well, we notice here, I'm going to go ahead and clean this up a little bit uh, for our, our three reactions. We would say, well, do we know something about our reaction that tells us something about our overall reaction? And by that, we want to say, do we have similar reactants and products? So we have carbon dioxide, we have water. So we notice we do have similar reactants and products, and we want to think about, can we take these reactions and add them up to give us our overall reaction? So let's go ahead and work through that together. So first, uh, what we want to do is we want to start with things that are only in one of our reactions. So I would not want to start with oxygen and try and figure out how many moles of oxygen I get because I noticed that it's in two different reactions. So that's kind of going to be helpful for me. So maybe I'm going to start with this reactant here, C2H4. I notice that I need it as a reactant and I need one mole of it, but I only have it as a product in this reaction. Well, the way that I can make it into a reactant is I can go ahead and flip what we consider our reactants and products. Now, what is that going to tell us now about our reaction? So let's go ahead and rewrite it where we do that. C2H4 goes to two moles of carbon, two moles of hydrogen. The enthalpy change now here is going to be the opposite, 57.5 kilojoules. So now it's positive 57.5 kilojoules as we flip that. So now I notice that, okay, good, I have my C2H4 here. Again, I'm going to skip our water and let's go to carbon dioxide. I need two moles of carbon dioxide as a product, and I notice I only have one mole of it here as a product that's not present in any other reaction. So I can go ahead and multiply all my coefficients by two. So again, our third, our sixth reaction, we flipped it. Our first, our fourth reaction, we're going to multiply all of them by two to give us two moles of carbon two moles of oxygen, two moles of carbon dioxide, and now what that will do is give us two times that original enthalpy change of negative 787.0 kilojoules. So now we have our two moles of carbon dioxide. Last thing is we need two moles of water. We notice we already have two moles of water here, so we, hopefully we shouldn't have to do anything else to give us our overall reaction. Now what we'd wanna do is we want to take all of these, and I'm just going to cross that one out to so make sure we're not trying to pay attention to that, and hopefully we can add up reaction 4, 5, and our modified reaction 6, and it should give us our overall reaction that we're looking for here. So we add that up, I get one mole of C2H4, great. I get one, two, three moles of oxygen, okay, that's what we wanted. We also have two moles of carbon dioxide, which is what we wanted. And we have, on our product side, two moles of water, which is what we wanted. Now what we notice is that we have all these other reactants and products that aren't part of our reaction. But hopefully, if we've done this correctly in looking at them, they're gonna be considered maybe like intermediates. They're produced along the way, or there's no net change in them. And the way that we can do that is that if they're on opposite sides of our arrow. So for example, if I look at, I got two moles of carbon, dioxide, uh, of carbon as a product in reaction six, I got two moles of carbon as a reactant in reaction four, the net effect is they're gonna cancel each other out. Likewise, I got two moles of hydrogen as a product in reaction six, two moles of hydrogen as a product in reaction five, a, react, a reactant, excuse me, in reaction five, and they cancel each other out. So the net effect is they're not being consumed or produced. So now that we've made it so that we have our reactions, the overall, so that'd be reaction seven, matches the overall that would happen if I were to do reaction four, reaction five, and modified reaction six, so flipped the order of those. And now when we do that, that's gonna give us our overall reaction here. So this is gonna be equal to 
negative 787.0 kilojoules, so that's what we had for our two times reaction for, plus the negative 571.6 kilojoules, again, we didn't do anything to reaction five, and then plus our positive 57.5 kilojoules for reaction six, and we would get an overall of negative 1301.1 kilojoules. Okay, so that's using Hess's law. Well, we also have the ability to utilize enthalpy of formation. So let's go ahead and do that one together as well and see how can we work through that same process because maybe that's how you did it, right? Because again, we know the enthalpy of formation of C2H4. We know the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide. We also know the enthalpy of formation of water as a liquid because we knew that from a previous step. We knew that from uh, question five when we we're looking at the enthalpy of formation ideas. So let's go ahead and do that one together. So the other possibility is using enthalpy of formation of all of our reactants and products. So let's go ahead and explicitly write out all of our reactants and products without putting in numbers yet. So again, the enthalpy change of our reaction is going to be two moles of carbon dioxide times the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide plus two moles of water as a liquid times the enthalpy of formation of water as a liquid. Okay, so that is all of our products. So how much energy would be released or consumed to make our products? From that, we're gonna subtract all of our reactants. So we have one mole of C2H4 and then we need the enthalpy of formation of C2H4 plus three moles of oxygen and the enthalpy of formation of oxygen for our reactants. So that is all of our reactants. We're unmaking them, right? Uh, for our reactants, we're breaking them all apart. So let's go ahead and put some numbers in here. So now we have two moles of carbon dioxide and the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide was negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. Then we have two moles of water as a liquid. And the enthalpy of formation of water as a liquid was negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. So that is all of our, react our products. From that, we're going to subtract our reactants, so one mole of C2H4, negative 57.5 kilojoules per mole. And then we have three moles of oxygen, but we notice we don't have any information about oxygen. Now let's think about that. We don't have any information about oxygen, but do we really need to know anything? Let's say we write out the enthalpy of formation, of the formation reaction of oxygen. So we're making oxygen, from oxygen. This would be the formation, quote unquote, reaction of O2 as a gas. So we notice that we have the same reactants and products. So we can think here, there's no change. That enthalpy change would be zero. There's nothing happening here. There's no reaction. And that would be the enthalpy of formation of O2. So we notice any element in its naturally occurring state oxygen as a gas, carbon as a solid, hydrogen as a gas, things that we've looked at before, well, their enthalpies of formation are actually zero. So now that we've filled in all that information in here, let's go ahead and tabulate it all up, plug it into our calculator, and we get negative 1301.1 kilojoules is equal to our enthalpy change. We get the same answer, again, because enthalpy is a state function, no matter if we think of making it from all of our elements in their pure elemental state, or think of making it from our formation reactions, or making it from these multiple steps of reaction four, five, and six, we get to the same place. And again, we had the opportunity to use either one of these to be able to quantify the enthalpy change. Now that we have that, let's go ahead and answer question eight. Four moles of oxygen was reacted with excess C2H4. So we can think of that would be our limiting reactant is O2, and our C2H4 is our excess reactant. 
So now if we have that information there, we want to figure out how much heat is released when we have this reaction occur. And we're looking at, again, reaction seven here. So this is reaction seven. Now, what information do we know? We know that the Q of a reaction is equal to the enthalpy change for the amount reacted. Now, the reason why we add in this amount reacted, what we're thinking about is we need to scale it to the amount that we would have there. So let's go ahead and start with first how much we have. We have four moles of O2. Well, we know that we are going to have an enthalpy change of negative 1301.1 kilojoules. And we think about for how much oxygen? Well, that would be if I were to react three moles of O2. Because we know this 1301.1 corresponds to the amount for three moles. Not just one mole of it, but three moles of it. And what we'll see here is that this is going to give us a value of heat the enthalpy change for the amount that we actually reacted, and that would be negative 1734.8 kilojoules. So again, we need to make sure we account for the amount that we have in our overall reaction. So hopefully this gives us a chance to look at enthalpies of formation, Hess's law, and how we were to apply them in specific reactions.